Hello and welcome to another Paraplanet Assembly short technical video and I'm pleased to be joined again by Elaine Cruikshank from Aegon and today we're talking about taking money from an investment bond and there are different ways to do this aren't there? That's right Richard, thank you. Um, there are two ways um, to take a withdrawal um, from uh, an investment bond if, if you only want to take part of the funds out of the investment bond. So the first way to take a withdrawal is by taking a part surrender across all of the life segments. Now that um, method uses the 5% tax deferred allowance. So what that means is that the investor can take 5% of their original investment back for 20 years. If they don't actually take a withdrawal in a year, then the unused 5% tax deferred allowance can be carried forward for use in future years. Um, they're not even, um, they're, um, they don't actually um, have to take 5% in the year, they could take 4%. And if they take 4% on a regular basis, then it would be 4% um, for 25 years, and then they would have taken all of the original capital back. What happens if they get to, to, to so let's say they've done 5% for 20 years and they still want to keep taking withdrawals, what happens then? Yeah, um, what happens then, um, Richard, is that um, any withdrawal that they take is pure chargeable event gain because there's no 5% tax deferred allowance available any longer okay. because they've used it all. And that chargeable event gain would arise at the end of the policy year. Okay. Um, and um, just a, another um, little nuance that I should probably highlight is the fact that um, obviously we, we talk about the fact that there's 5% for 20 years. Um, but if they top up the bond, for example, in year two, then the 5% tax deferred allowance in relation to the top up would run from year two to year 21. Um, so that's just something that I just felt I should drop in there for information. Um, and this method of taking withdrawals can give rise to an artificial gain because it can give rise to gains when the bond is actually sat at an economic loss. In contrast, the other way of taking withdrawals is actually by cashing in individual segments. And when you cash in segments, the tax calculation or the chargeable event calculation uses the full surrender calculation and it ignores the 5% allowance and it actually calculates the economic gain that there is with those segments. Brilliant. And if you have a client that's got a loss on their investment bond, have a look at our investment losses short video because there might be something you can do to help them out. So we've got a, an example here. That's right. I thought I would illustrate um, the difference um, in the two methods and um, using an example. So we've got Helen who invested 100,000 in an offshore bond comprising 20 segments on the 2nd of July 2019. And then on the 3rd of July, so at the start of the new policy year, so the policy year um, runs from um, the date of the investment until the day before the anniversary. So in this year, the policy, so in this example here, the policy year would be the 2nd of July, 2019 until the 1st of July, 2020. So you can see she's in her second policy year. She needs to take a withdrawal on the 3rd of July, 2020, when the surrender value is 114,286. Um, she needs to take a withdrawal of 80,000 to pay for a deposit on a flat. Um, she's got the two options. What do you think she should do? I think she should be happy. It's gone up in value in the last year. But uh, let, let's take right. a look at the, um, the, the partial surrenders first of all, shall we? Um, so if she were to take a withdrawal across all of the segments, this would make use of the 5% tax deferred allowance. So the 5% rule that we talked about earlier. So with this rule, you can take up to 5% of the premium invested each year with no immediate tax charge. So as I mentioned, she's in the second policy year. So she's got two years worth of 5% tax deferred allowance that she can offset against the withdrawal of 80,000. So you can see that if she takes the withdrawal across all of the segments, that will give rise to a gain of 70,000. But this is an artificial gain because you'll remember from the example um, when we set out um, the, the summary of, of the case study that the bond was only sat at 114,000, so it's at four, around 14,000 of a gain as opposed to the 70,000 of a gain. Okay, that's quite a difference, isn't it? So, how about if she did a, a full segment surrender? If she does a full surrender of segments, then um, it uses the um, final surrender calculation. So, you've got the surrender value of the segments 
plus the previous withdrawals that relate to those segments, less the premiums invested into those segments, plus any previous chargeable event gains arising on those segments. So in this example, she needs to surrender 14 segments to realise 80,000. So you've got 80,000 pounds of surrender value. She's not taken any previous withdrawals. And then you take away the um, premium that's invested into these um, segments. So that's um, 14 divided by 20 multiplied by the amount invested of 100,000. So that gives you 70,000 of investment into these 14 segments. Um, so you take that away from the surrender value and that gives you a gain of 10,000. And this is an actual economic gain. So it's not an artificial gain as it was with the withdrawal across the segments. Okay, so on paper for this one, it seems a bit of a no brainer to me that she's better off surrendering full segments. Is it always better to do it that um, way? Not in every case, but actually in the early years of a bond, it's usually better for large surrenders to take a, um, to cash in segments rather than take a withdrawal across the bond. But the date of the chargeable event could be important. So, um, for example, they might have the investor might have less taxable income in one tax year as opposed to the other. Um, they may be able to um, take a drawdown holiday, for example, to manage the tax liability. So it's worth bearing in mind the actual timing of these chargeable event gains. So when are they liable to tax? So with a withdrawal across the policy, um, the chargeable event gain arises at the end of the policy year. So in Helen's case, that would be on the 1st of July 2021. So that would fall in the tax year 2021-22. But for full surrenders of segments, it's the date of the cash in of those um, segments that matters. So in this case, it would be the 3rd of July, 2020. So that would be in this current tax year of 2020, 21. Mm -hmm. So the timing of the chargeable event gain might have some relevance if the taxable income that the investor has varies year on year. This is really important if you're working with clients that may be in, in retirement and are using drawdown as well, that, that the timing of the income from one source or another can, can make a big difference on the tax, can't it? So very important to look at that one. But what if you make the wrong choice? Um, this happens so often, I have to admit. Um, I've, I've been asked this question on quite a few occasions. Um, there are two options um, that a, a client could consider. Firstly, they could consider applying to HMRC for a recalculation of the gain if it's wholly disproportionate, or they could surrender the bond in the same tax year, and that would give you a final year calculation. There's been a recent case, I forgot the name now, hasn't there, where this was put to test? That's right. Um, so as far as the um, case is concerned, it was the Lobler case. And in the Lobler case, um, Mr. Lobler had invested a considerable sum into, um, offshore bond, into an offshore bond, and he took a large withdrawal in the early years of the bond, giving rise to quite a humongous um, chargeable event gain. And um, the bond, however, was sat... Um, um, actually, the, the bond didn't, didn't have much of a gain because it was the early years. So he crystallised a, a large gain that he needn't have crystallised had he taken the withdrawal by way of cashing in segments. Mm -hmm. He unfortunately hadn't taken advice um, in this regard and had completed the um, surrender request form um, in his own name. So HMRC were keen that these problems um, don't arise again in the future. So they now allow um, investors to apply to HMRC for a recalculation of the gain if it's wholly disproportionate. Um, the only thing is that there are no guidelines as to what wholly disproportionate actually means. Yeah. And HMRC did view it that they wanted this option to be used in a limited number of, um, situ situ a limited number of situations rather than um, you know, in every eventuality. And also what is disproportionate to one person might not be disproportionate to another. So for example, if Granny Miggins, for example, basic rate taxpayer with modest means incurs a chargeable event gain of say um, 100,000, for example, that might be wholly disproportionate to her, but yet you might have an investor that invests a million pounds into an offshore bond and crystallizes a gain of 100,000 um, and they've got they, they, they've got like more wealth um, in their hands. So actually that gain wouldn't be as disproportionate for them. So it's, it's one of these cases where um, you have to take, take a look at the client's um, 
income, their wealth, and um, the actual level of the gain to see whether it would be deemed disproportionate or not. And um, if the client does want to go down the route of applying to HMRC for a recalculation of the gain, they have to do it within four years of the end of the tax year in which the chargeable event gain arose. And they have to do it in writing. And um, there's no um, set format for doing this. Um, they have to um, provide a copy of the charge of the event certificate, a copy of the withdrawal instruction that was provided to the life company. They also have to explain why they made the mistake. Um, and um, they also um, have to provide any other relevant documents that would help HMRC in making a ruling as far as their case is concerned. It's still a bit, uh, a bit woolly, isn't it, to say the least. Um, but That's right. Put, putting that case to one side, we've got an example about poor old Mr B, um, yeah, who's got a problem. That's right. So Mr B, um, he invested um, 600,000 into a bond in September 2018. And actually in the first policy year, he withdrew 500,000 across the bond. Um, obviously, he didn't take advice and took the withdrawal in the wrong way, um, because that um, withdrawal would give rise to a gain of 470,000 because there's only one year's worth of 5% tax deferred allowance available to offset against that withdrawal. And that gain of 470,000 would crystallize on the 22nd of September, 2019. So in other words, in the tax year 2019-20. So obviously he's got two options. The gain is quite substantial. So he could potentially apply to HMRC for a recalculation of the wholly disproportionate gain. So by providing all of the reasons um, for the gain, you know, why, why he took it in that way and providing a copy of the charge of the event certificate and um, the withdrawal instruction and other relevant information. Or alternatively, he could simply cash in the policy in the same tax year as the chargeable event gain. So if he cashes in the policy in the tax year 2019-20, then you've got special final year rules that apply. So if he encashes the bond on the 30th of October 2019, when the surrender value is 105,000, then the 470,000 pound gain is simply swept aside as though it never happened. And the final chargeable event gain is 105,000 plus the previous withdrawal of 500,000 less the premium invested into the bond of 600,000 and giving you a final chargeable event gain of 5,000. So as you can see that 470,000 is simply swept aside as though it never happened. That's almost but it like has to be out. done. It's a get out of jail free card, is it? But you've got to do it um, in the, pretty in quick. The same it, you have to do it in the same tax year. And the problem is that sometimes the chargeable event certificate arrives around the end of the tax year yes. because life companies have 90 days in which to issue and send out the um, chargeable event certificate. So it's only when the client gets the chargeable event certificate that they'll come to the advisor and say, um, I've got this chargeable event certificate, what does it actually mean? So if they're lucky, then they will be able to rectify the position by encashing in the same tax year. If not, then they may be able to apply to HMRC for a recalculation um, if the gain is deemed wholly disproportionate. And in that situation, as I mentioned previously, they'll have four years from the end of the tax year. Brilliant. Well, there's some things to do with bond surrenders and some things not to do and some possible ways to get yourself out of a hole if you need to. So, Elaine, that was brilliant. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again soon. Goodbye.